So let us look at major cytokines that are produced by macrophages. These are five major cytokines that you need to know with regards to the macrophages. The first and foremost is interleukin-1. I want you to know that interleukin-1, in addition to macrophages, may also be produced by epidermal cells, epithelial cells, lymphoid cells, and vascular tissues as well. However, macrophages are by far the major source of interleukin-1. So what does interleukin-1 do? It causes fever and it upregulates cellular metabolism. It induces cyclooxygenase type 2. In the chapter on endocrinology, we're going to cover cyclooxygenase system and we, we're going to compare and contrast cyclooxygenase type 1 which plays physiological roles in the body, let's call it the good cyclooxygenase, and cyclooxygenase type 2, which is involved in inflammatory responses. Anyhow, interleukin 1, one of the major roles is production of cyclooxygenase 2 and arachidonic acid metabolites that are involved in inflammation production. Interleukin-1 synergizes with tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is another product of macrophages. It also causes T-cell recruitment and activation of the same macrophage or other macrophages. The other product is interleukin-6. Just to know, interleukin-6 is also produced by T-cells. Interleukin-6 also produces fever, and in this respect is similar to interleukin-1 in function. The reason, of course, that 1 and 6, interleukin-1 and 6, they produce fever is that because they have the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and they initiate synthesis of prostaglandin E2 in the hypothalamus. So the immediate cause of reset of the thermostat for temperature in a body is prostaglandin E2, which is ultimately due to interleukin 1 and 6 function. Interleukin 6 also induces acute phase proteins via liver. Interleukin 6 is also considered to be a myokine. Myokine is a cytokine produced from muscle in response to muscle contraction and exercise. It is shown that interleukin-6 has extensive anti-inflammatory functions in its role as a myokine. This interleukin also activates lymphocytes, B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. It causes their differentiation and proliferation. It also increases antibody production through B-cell stimulation. The next interleukin is interleukin-8. Just to know, this is also produced by epithelial and endothelial cells and also by the airway smooth muscles. Another name for this interleukin, actually the more descriptive term, and I want you to remember this term because it also tells about the function of the interleukin-8 is neutrophil chemotactic factor. So interleukin-8 causes chemotaxis in neutrophils and attracts the neutrophils to the site of inflammation or to the site of the injury of the pathogens. Interleukin-8 activates neutrophils, and induces phagocytosis in them. It is also a potent promoter of angiogenesis. So it causes local angiogenesis, formation of more blood vessels, and as a result, delivery of more blood, and as a result, delivery of more innate cells into the site of injury of pathogens. Then we have interleukin-12. 
Interleukin-12, the highest number, activates natural killer cells that are big cells. So this gives you a light mnemonic to remember that the highest number goes with the natural killer cells that are big cells. Interleukin-12 also induces differentiation of CD4 positive cells and converts them and helps them to differentiate into T helper 1 cells. We're going to talk about these more in detail later. Finally, the next important factor produced by macrophages is tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. What does this factor do? It activates macrophages and induces nitric oxide. Of course, as you can see, nitric oxide is a vasodilator, so that also explains, you know, the edema formation as a result of inflammation. This factor is pro-inflammatory and causes fever, and of course, later we see if there is too much production of this, this may end up to cause shock in some of the patients. So, a very high yield concept and commonly tested fact is that uncontrolled production of tumor necrosis factor may cause shock. And later we see that bacteria that are able to produce super antigens may cause serious problems for the patients. And one such serious problems is the issue of septic shock that can be deadly. And I want you to lock in TNF alpha as the pathophysiological cause of the septic shock. A 25-year-old female presents to the hospital complaining of headache, fever, and generalized joint pain. She says that four days ago, after walking her dog in the woods behind her farmhouse, she felt an insect bite at the back of her shoulder. A day later, she had a 38.2 centigrade fever, and the sight of the bite appeared more painful. When she looked at the bite site in the mirror, it appeared like a circular rash. She applied local hydrocortisone cream to the site and took over the counter ibuprofen for the next two days. However, her joint pain and headache progressively worsened. On examination, you notice that she has a fever of 41 degrees, a heart rate of 85, and a large circular target-like rash on her back that is about 17 by 19 centimeters in diameter. Which of the following options best explains these findings? Of course, that large circular and target like rash reminds you of Lyme disease. However, the question asks you which of the following best explains ventricular tachycardia, atrial flutter, heart block, anaphylactic reaction, or Arthur's reaction? Well, the best answer is heart block. As we said, the patient most likely has Lyme disease and she has Lyme carditis that is often associated with self-limited conductive system disease or disease of the conductive system of the heart, including heart block. Interleukin-1 and to a large extent interleukin-6 are the two that they cause inflammation and fever in response to invasion of the body by Borrelia, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease. The rule of thumb, and I want you to lock in this information, states that fevers, each degree above the normal bodily temperature, will raise the heart rate by 10 beats per minute. And I want you to know these degrees are in centigrade. So this is the rule of thumb that I want you to lock in and relate it to interleukin 1 and 6 and the extent to which physiologically 
they are able to produce fever. So each degree above the normal bodily temperature raises the heart rate by 10 beats. The temperature of the patient is raised about 4 degrees above the normal. Therefore, the increased heart rate due to interleukin 1 and 6 collectively and inflammation must be about 40 beats above normal. Given that the current heart rate of the patient is 85, her baseline heart rate must have been 45, which is bradycardia. This finding is compatible with heart block, which happens to be a major symptom of Lyme disease. I want you to know that the other typical symptoms of heart block include palpitation, syncope, chest pain, and dyspnea. Of course, you may ask, what are the major infectious diseases that they cause heart block? And as you can tell, there are more conditions other than Lyme disease that they can cause heart block. The must know ones for your examination, for USMLE and complex examinations are Legionella, Lyme disease, Chagas disease, diphtheria, typhoid fever, rheumatic fever, and pertosis. What is the treatment of choice for heart block in above diseases? Of course, remember, your role as a physician is to first diagnose and then treat. We have done the diagnosis, now it's time to treat. Well, atropine administration is helpful. Also, we can provide temporary cardiac pacing. For instance, we can provide transvenous and transcutaneous cardiac pacing for these patients. What are the top indications for temporary cardiac pacing? Hemodynamically unstable bradycardia or unstable clinical conditions that stem from bradycardia. Okay, this is a good time for us to talk about antibodies, B cell receptors, BCRs, and T cell receptors, TCRs. As you can tell, there are some fundamental similarities among these three, and that's why I have lumped them all together for you. And in this diagram, I'm showing a B cell receptor on the left side, and as you can see, there are many receptors on the surface of these B cells, but each receptor has two binding sites for epitopes or for antigens. In contrast, the TCRs, the T cell receptors, they have one binding site. But again, I'm just showing four of these receptors. These are four of many on the surfaces of these adaptive cells. So both B and T cells have surface receptors for antigen. Each cell has thousands of receptors of a single specificity. This is important means that these receptors bind only one and only one particular epitope. The B cell receptor is a transmembrane receptor protein. By transmembrane, I mean it relays the outside information to the inside B cell environment. So this is a transmembrane protein located on the outer surface of B cells. The receptor's binding moiety is composed of a membrane-bound antibody that has a specific and randomly determined antigen binding sites. So structurally, the B cell receptor resembles the antibody structure, and that's why I have lumped them together in this segment. When a B cell is activated by its first encounter with an antigen, 
that binds to its surface or to its receptor, let's call it the cognate antigen, the antigen that this particular B cell or any particular B cell can recognize. Now the B cell proliferates. The B cell differentiates to generate, to generate a population of antibody secreting plasma cells. And they differentiate into so-called memory B cells that will retain the memory of that epitope or that antigen for a long, long, long time. The T cell receptor is a molecule on the surface of T lymphocytes that is responsible for recognizing fragments of the antigen or peptides or epitopes that are bound to major histocompatibility complex. So this is important. The T cell recognize the fragments only when they are presented on the surface of these antigen presenting cells on their major histocompatibility complexes. We're going to talk about this more in detail shortly. The binding between TCR and antigen peptides is of a relatively low affinity and it's degenerate. That is, many TCRs recognize the same antigen peptide and many antigen peptides are recognized by the same TCR. Let's talk a little about the antibodies. Antibodies are glycoproteins. They are made up of subunits containing two identical light chains and two identical heavy chains. The end terminal of the heavy chain and light chains make the variable region, the V region. And H is for heavy and L is for light. The variable the variable region is a specific for each antibody that body produces. The variable regions provide the antigen binding site, antigen binding site to which the epitopes or antigens are attached. In contrast to the enormous variability of the amino acid sequence of the N terminals, the carboxyl terminals the other end of the antibody or the constant region only shows a limited number of variability. Each antibody expresses two different kinds of C regions, constant regions for the light chains, a kappa and a lambda chain. However, each antibody expresses five different kinds of C regions for their heavy chains. These are the mu chains. These are the ones that, as we're going to see shortly, make the IgM antibodies. Gamma chains that make IgG. Alpha chains make IgA. Delta chains make IgD. And epsilon chains make IgE. I want you to note that these five types of heavy chains may have no predilection for lambda or kappa light chains. Let's look at the structure of the antibodies. I'm showing the N-terminal and the antigen binding site is at the N-terminal. I'm showing the light chain. I'm showing the variable, the variable segment V for variable, so we have of the two binding sites, each one of them has one variable light and one variable heavy component. And then I'm showing the hinge, and the hinge, if you're interested, allows the fab region to rotate and to have flexibility. And because of the flexibility, the two binding sites can grab the epitopes or grab the antigens better. So it includes flexibility for the antibodies to grab the epitopes better. Then I'm showing the FC portion, and as you can tell, the 
constant region has three segments designated as CH1, CH2, and CH3. For now, just to know, the complement binding sites are located in the domain area of the CH2 of the antibody. In research and, and also for pharmaceutical companies and for monoclonal antibody production, it's very important for us to be able to degrade these uh, antibodies into components of the antibodies. It is shown in the lab that when we add the compound papain to the antibody, it breaks it into three fragments, two fab fragments and one FC fragment. However, when we add pepsin to the antibody, it breaks it into two components, a conjoined fab and a single FC component. Another important high yield concept in immunology is the concept of antibodies and serum protein electrophoresis. In experimental settings, the enzyme papain, which is derived from papaya plant, breaks the antibody molecules into two fab and one FC fragments, as we showed earlier. The enzyme pepsin, however, cleaves below the hinge region, so it makes two fragments, a two-parted fab and one FC fragment. On serum electrophoresis, immunoglobulins such as IgM or IgG or gamma globulins stay closer closer to the anode anode pole due to heavier molecular weight that they have and due to fewer negative charges that they have in contrast albumin which is smaller and has a lot more negative charges migrates farthest towards the positive pole, towards the cathode, as you see in this diagram. And as you can tell, by just looking at this diagram, if I ask you what is the most prominent protein in the blood, you can say the albumin, because it has the tallest, essentially, deflection on serum protein electrophoresis. And of course, after the albumin, Based on the size and based on the negative charges, then we're going to have the alpha-1 globulins, alpha-2 globulins, beta globulins, and gamma globulins. And of course, as you can tell, the gamma globulins include the immunoglobulins. Again, to summarize, based on weight and density, proteins are distributed from cathode to anode, serum albumin, alpha-1 globulins, alpha-2 globulins, beta globulins, and gamma globulins are the closest to the anode pole. The major proteins in transition zone, transition zone are zones between alpha-1 or alpha-2 or alpha-2 and beta or beta and gamma. The major proteins in transition zone between albumin and alpha-1 zone is high-density lipoproteins. The major protein of alpha-1 zone is alpha-1 antitrypsin. And of course, if I have a child who is suffering from genetic recessive defect in antitrypsin formation, you expect the alpha-1 zone to flatten out in those children. Major protein of alpha-2 zone is haptoglobin, which is produced by the liver. Of course, antitrypsin is for most part produced by the liver again. Major beta zone proteins are transferrin and LDL. Major beta and gamma interzone protein is C-reactive protein. And of course, for most part, these proteins that I've named they are involved in inflammation, and they are practically acute phase proteins. Now, normally, gamma zone only includes immunoglobulins. If the gamma zone shows an increase or a spike, the spikes are either narrow or they are wide. 
if the spike is elevated in a single narrow manner, what it does indicate is the fact that we have monoclonal production of a single immunoglobulin. The technical term for this is monoclonal gammopathy. However, if you have a wide swell-like increase, then we have polyclonal immunoglobulin production. Polyclonal means that more than one plasma cell is involved in making those immunoglobulins, or those immunoglobulins are against more than just one antigen or epitope. To drill you a little and show you how they may give you a question related to these concepts on the exam, my question to you, after you have looked, of course, at the normal serum electrophoresis of the proteins, you can answer this question. So what is the most likely diagnosis for the following finding? And of course, the characteristic finding is in the gamma globulin position. And this is a good case scenario for multiple myeloma. Actually, electrophoresis of it shows a narrow, tall sort of finding in gamma globulin position on electrophoresis. This single narrow M spike in multiple myeloma is either due to IgG or IgA. So both of these antibodies are involved. But the spike is in one, one position only, it means that these IgGs and these IgAs are of the same isotype as we're going to see shortly. These IgGs and IgAs are against the same antigen or presumed antigen as we're going to see later. To look at another question, what is the most likely diagnosis for this finding? And to compare it with the normal, you're going to see the position of the albumin is the striking finding. It's flattened out a little, or there is less albumin in there. This is a good case for hypoalbuminemia, which may result from nephrotic syndrome. So this patient may have nephrotic syndrome. True or false, the FAP segment of the antibody determines the isotype of the antibody. That's false. FAB determines the idiotype, and the FC is the one that determines the isotype. Remember this. Idiotype for antigen specificity and variable regions. Isotype encodes functionally similar proteins. To explain this for you, maybe this is not clear, means that isotype may be IgM or IgG or IgA antibodies. These antibodies may be against the very, very same idiotype. So, let me rephrase again. The same antibody with the same idiotype that can identify the very same epitope will produce different types of isotypes. IgM, which is the first antibody that body produces, as we're going to see later, against a particular antigen, or IgA against the very same antigen, or IgG, which is the most prevalent form of antibody against the very same antigen in the blood. We're going to be talking more about this as we go on. True or false? IgE antibodies bind complements at CH2 segment of their FC fragment. Of course, by looking at this diagram, you can see the complements bind to CH2 region. What do you think? Is this true or is it false? Actually, <laughs> this is false. And I want to bring to your attention a very important concept that only IgG and IgM bind complements. They bind it, of course, at CH2 domain of their FC fragments. True or false? 
Antibodies or glycoproteins and their carbohydrate moieties are attached to their CH2 domain. This is correct. What are the major functions of carbohydrates, of immunoglobulins, that, of course, as we said earlier, they are attached to the CH2 domain? Carbohydrate contents range from about 2% for IgG to 13% for the other immunoglobulins. Carbohydrates are mainly attached to CH2 domain, and they affect the overall solubility and rate of catabolism of the antibodies. As you can tell, the function is not as clear yet to us. They also is said to affect the binding of antibodies to effective cells such as macrophages, T helper cells, or complements. 